Okay, welcome everybody. We'll just wait uh, a couple of seconds to make sure everybody can get in to this webinar. Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar, Transforming Plastic into Art with Assyrian environmental artist, Maria Neeson. I'm Alexandra, the executive director at the nonprofit organization, Assyrian Studies Association, with a mission to promote the academic study of the Assyrian heritage through supporting research, teaching, and intellectual collaboration among scholars in various fields from around the globe. As an attendee, your microphone and video will be muted and turned off throughout the presentation. All questions will be entertained after the presentation. And please refer to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions you may have. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our presenter for this special webinar. Maria Neeson is an environmental Assyrian artist who was born in California and is currently living in Amman, Jordan. Maria graduated with a bachelor's degree in art education and holds a master's degree in studio art from SACI College of Art and Design in Florence, Italy. Maria's passion is about reaching into the hearts and minds of people by transforming trash into art in a way that challenges our consumers' behavior and the waste we generate. While, we, uh, while her focus is about plastic pollution of, her, of the urban and natural environments in Amman, the time spent in Europe gave her the opportunity to create seasonal, uh, excuse me, sensorial um, installations about other themes that are close to her heart, such as feminism, as well as art therapy for venerable communities. Um, she is currently creating installations and art pieces for several gallery spaces using trash materials collected in the streets of Amman. You can discover her artwork by visiting her social media pages at Maria Neeson Art. Maria, thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome. Thank you. I um, just want to take a moment to thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak about my career and what I'm passionate about and the opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals. And um, hopefully everything is Great. <laughs> so Wonderful. just thank you. Of course, yes, um, it's our honor. Um, so why don't we begin uh, the presentation? So um, Maria, can you kind of introduce uh, to the audience what inspired you into making art? And can you kind of tell us about your Assyrian background? Yes, so um, I was born in America in 1987 and I've always been really creative growing up. And at some point I was a flight attendant when I was in my twenties. And when I decided to go back to college, I just registered for all these fun courses. Uh, I took ballet and jazz and uh, a music appreciation, pottery, drawing, and I stuck with pottery. I really enjoyed it. And I just fell in love with the way that it is manipulated in my hands. So I changed to be an art major and I dedicated my life to art moving forward. I was raised in California and uh, moved to Georgia by Iraqi Assyrian parents. Both of my parents had um, traditional arranged wedding, got married in America, left Iraq. Uh, and Assyrian was my, my first language and culture that I was exposed to growing up and that that was very difficult growing up in America being raised by Assyrians and only being able to speak to your family in this language and only understanding your culture through your family and being surrounded by a whole different kind of culture and not fitting in I always had these cultural identity issues uh, growing up so um, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown of things and then we'll dive into each one a little bit more into detail. So I moved to Florence, Italy, where I got my master's degree after receiving my bachelor's in art education and painting and drawing. And I got my master's degree in Italy, stayed there for two and a half years, working on large scale installations. Later on, after I graduated, I started an art therapy program in Athens, Greece, 
where I worked with refugees and got them integrated into the culture. After a year of doing that, I finally came to where I currently am now, which is Amman, Jordan, where I continued building plastic installations and art pieces. And all of these kind of tied together because my father, when he was trying to migrate to America, he had gone to several different countries um, trying to get the passport stamp to get into America. And he went to Italy and to Greece. So my path has been following his ways. And yeah, so we'll start with Florence, Italy, unless you have any questions or. No, no, please go ahead. Okay. So after I received my bachelor's degree in art education, I wanted to get my master's and I wanted to go abroad because I wanted to do more research on my cultural identity and my heritage, but I didn't want to go to the Middle East. I was very scared at the time and I wanted to leave America. So I got into Italy. Um, the school is called Studio Arts. And um, when I got into the school, I had gotten into several other colleges for my master's degree, but I took it as a sign that I should go to Italy because that's where my father went when he was trying to come to America during the Iraq and Iran war. So I accepted and I went, I stayed there for two and a half years. And while I was in Florence, Italy, I created a number of large scale installations that raised questions about what had happened to me growing up and things that I started to identify with as an Assyrian. Um, which brings me to my first installation. This was called, uh, My Mother Was My First Country. So as you all know, when you are doing research about countries or origins and traditions, one of the most symbol symbolic iconic image is a flag. And we are able to resonate emotions based on flag and I decided to work with the color palettes of the Assyrian and American flag on one side and the color palette of the Iraqi flag on the other. So I covered an entire room with plastic and I put tape all over the room and divided it in half. So on one half, we have those colors of the Assyrian flag and American flag and the other half is the Iraqi. So I did a performance piece inside this space painting the entire space with my hands. And after I was finished and it dried, I removed the tape from both sides and integrated it onto the other side. So the room became one entity and one being of all of these different backgrounds mixed together in one space. And when I got to the root of who I was, I titled the piece, my mother was my first country, because within that lies everything. And that was the base of my research, uh, my first year in my master's degree program, which later led me to my thesis piece. That's really beautiful. Um, so this one is, uh, this one is a really amazing, um, uh, the second one, my fragrance since birth uh, that you created. Yes, um, can you tell us a little bit about this piece and, how this connects to the Assyrian culture and more specifically Assyrian cuisine? Yes. So after I finished the visual piece with the flags, I wanted to get a little bit more into the scent because I feel like scent is the fastest way to trigger a memory. When we smell something, we relate it instantly back to something that has happened to us. And our Assyrian family is known for having the best smells in our kitchen. So growing up as a child, I always had the smell of cumin and allspice, paprika, curry, all of these very intense aromas. And when I was in Italy, I started getting really lonely and homesick. So I wanted to bring back a piece of me into an installation and also be able to share that with others. And uh, what I did was I painted a room and on the floor, I would get the physical seasonings and do paintings on the floor with the seasonings. So during this performance piece, it would provoke the smell of an Assyrian kitchen. And then I would invite 
the Italians and uh, colleagues and everyone that was um, within the space to physically come and manipulate these spices with their feet because it was still wet paint. So they actually had an interaction and it became more of a community-based project because after I invited the viewers and the audience onto the piece, once it was dried, I hung it up and built an installation room. So for uh, an exhibition later on, after the performance piece, people were also invited once again to interact in the space, knowing that their footprint had touched these seasonings and um, it was just covering them everywhere and they were completely evoked and forced into smelling my childhood <laughs> and smelling what Assyrians kitchens smell like, which was very beautiful to me and raised a lot of questions as well, <laughs> as you can imagine. So um, after the first year of investigation, I wanted to incorporate all of it together. So what I did with that is I thought about the coffee culture that we have as uh, Assyrians where we're all sitting down with our grandmas and our khaltis and aunts and uncles and cousins. And they're on the couch doing the fortune readings with our coffee. So we, we drink the coffee, then, you know, our aunt or grandma or whoever will flip the cup uh, to read our fortune that has been engraved inside with the grounds of the coffee. And this goes back, way back into ancestral times. And what was very special about coffee culture with Assyrians is that I had created this type of memory that we are the only ones that have this strong coffee culture that we do this performance with it, but that's it, that's our thing. But actually Italians have a completely different coffee culture. It's a very fast paced espresso shot and go away, but they're super enriched in this type of culture. And Americans, you know, they sit down, they go to cafes, Wi-Fi, everything's work related. So when I was coming home to visit my family, um, I had gotten 16 local restaurants and cafes in Georgia to collect their coffee filters over a six month period. And then I brought that back with me in my suitcase to Italy. And then I got the Italian restaurants that were serving American coffees to also collect these paper filters. So I started working with waste consumption in the food industry. And I had physically sewn all of these coffee filters together and I called it 18,443 souls because for each coffee filter, 20 people had drank a cup of coffee from it. So when I multiplied it times the amount of filters I collected, that's how many uh, interactive people that were not even aware they were going to be part of the installation. Uh, so when I did my master thesis project, I created this installation. Obviously, the scent of coffee was very strong and with the filters. But I had also sat down and invited every viewer that had come to see our exhibition to sit down and have a cup of Arabic coffee with me. And after they were done, they would flip the cup and I would do the fortune reading for them. And it was very interesting because no one had heard about this, this thing that we all do so um, enriching in the experience of coffee. And I, I really enjoyed the questions and people's astonishment. And, you know, months later, I still got messages through social media saying what a great experience it was for them and how they started doing research and uh, fell in love with it. So it was very beautiful to witness. That is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I could just imagine like the amount of smell, like the, the aroma of coffee in that one room, just overpowering everybody's senses and just you know, um, enjoying it because I mean, it's a, it's a performance piece too, because they get to um, engage in the art by drinking the coffee and you telling them the fortune. So that is, that is really impressive. Um, before we move on to the next uh, couple of slides, I, I kind of, um, I think you just, you got your master's degree uh, at this point. So, um, and then you began to do your art therapy journey, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
Can you kind of explain to us what drove you into that profession after completing your degree? Yes. So after I finished my master's degree, I knew I wanted to stay overseas. And I knew that I needed to do something important. I just had this type of energy and passion that, okay, I've done the gallery shows and installations, but I've only really helped a very small amount in the community understand our culture better. And I started thinking about my parents because my parents had migrated to America during the Iraq and Iran war. And they don't talk about it. They are not really great at speaking about their emotions or what had happened to them while they were in Iraq. And um, communicating has been a big barrier for them. And I know that is because when they came to America, they had endured this trauma. And for them to discuss it, uh, it, it was easier to just swallow. So I wanted to create a type of therapy for refugees that were integrating into a new culture and a new community to where they could express themselves without having to speak the language. So I kept hearing people tell me art therapy seems like a good venue for you. You're like, And then eventually it just kind of all came together. I started doing applications. I applied in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Jordan, and then Greece as well. But I heard back from Greece first. So I was like, okay, my dad went there, let's go. <laughs> and it still seemed like a safer option than coming, you know, to Syria or Iraq or one of the countries at the time. So slowly but surely I'm making my way to the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I started an art therapy program in Greece. And I worked with a large amount of refugees that were coming from all over the Middle East, from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, Iran, and a huge type of demographics. I was working with the LGB community. I was working with young teenage women. I was working with children, with single adult men. They would have different workshops throughout the day with different demographics of people coming from these countries. And we would just sit and create art together. And it was a really enriching experience because when they would come to Greece from their country of war, they weren't able to talk about what was going on with them. They had the language barrier and then most of them didn't want to discuss it. So I gave them a channel that they could create and release through this medium of art that didn't require them to speak or give any information about what they were going through, but still able to express it. So I did this for a year and that was very emotional and very um, needed. I, I needed to understand better what my family had gone through. And even though I didn't hear it from them physically, working with refugees in a European country very was, was a great opportunity and um, really helped me also communicate better with my family and have a deeper understanding of what was going on with them emotionally to understand currently the results of 30 years later, what had taken place. So that was Athens, Greece. Which then brings me to where I currently am now in Amman, Jordan. So after a while, I decided that I wanted to move and try something new because art therapy was very enriching and very satisfying and um, really got to my heart. But after a while, I wanted to get back to grounding in art and working back with the installations. I felt like a piece was missing and it was starting to become very emotional, working with children that were dealing with trauma and um, creating a barrier to not bring that home with me, which I was not very successful at. So I decided to come to Jordan. I had a friend who had lived here and I had known people that were you know, traveling to Jordan, rather safe country. 
close to Iraq. It was one of the bordering countries. My father had been here. So I came for a visit and I just fell in love with the country. Also, it's the only Middle Eastern country I've ever been to. So I'm sure that has a lot to do with it, but the people are very welcoming. There is uh, a huge amount of culture enriched here. And I have seen people that look like me that, you know, are able to recognize that I'm Arabic and not play a guessing game when they meet me. And that was, that was amazing in itself because, you know, until I came to Jordan, I had never spoken with another Assyrian or um, anyone that, you know, even knew who we were, let alone anything else. So that was, that was amazing. And I kept seeing the Edegila pipes, you know, these pipes that our uncles smoke in. And this, this is a big thing because when we have huflas and we have parties, the men are known to go into a separate room from the women in our culture and they sit and they smoke their Edegila pipes and make jokes. And it's like, when you're a kid seeing this, oh, it's the cool room that's where you want to be. So as a kid, we'd always like sneak in and see what they're doing by the door. And uh, when everybody would leave, we would smoke or like, you know, try to, we were kids. But anyway, so the Edgila pipes kept popping up in all these cafes. And I noticed it was a huge social setting. You know, come over, we'll hang out, we'll smoke, this, is and that. We'll go to a cafe, have a coffee, smoke. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is big. The Edgila pipes are made from these plastics and per cafe pre-COVID, there were about 200 of these plastic pipes that were getting thrown away and uh, per cap, like per cafe. So you can't even imagine in the country how many of this was going into the trash and back into our landscapes. And I started doing more and more research on this plastic waste that was hugely accumulating. And the more research I started doing, the more I realized that I, I have to do something with this. I have to raise awareness. And I also worked with the plastic bottles because in Jordan, there's a scarcity of water. So every time you go to um, a restaurant, the water is imported and it comes in plastic bottles. So they also have a huge amount of waste with the plastic. They don't have enough water to supply in the restaurants and cafes. So they have to bring in the bottles and it's filtered and clean. And um, so I started building these large scale installations from the waste that was being thrown away in the streets here that also represented my Assyrian culture with the Ergila pipes, but also the issues that were happening here in Jordan. And um, yeah, so I started very slow. <laughs> it took me a while to be able to speak a little bit of Arabic to even ask for the supplies before they throw them in the trash. And but, but once I started, people were very much into the idea, especially in the art world here because recycling and waste consumption is not something that is highly talked about in the Middle East, let alone in rural countries or areas that don't even have trash cans, let alone a recycling facility. Wow. Um, and so I think this was where you kind of really, you began using all these, um, these trash materials, these plastic materials to kind of build these large scale installations um, in Amman. Can you, uh, can you kind of walk us through the different types of themes that you have with these installations? Yeah, so with the installations, I started collecting from the cafes and restaurants, the Ergila pipes and the plastic waste. And then I would walk my dog every day around the streets uh, just for his daily walks. And I would collect as I'm walking. So the more I started venturing out in Amman and going to these places, the more trash I would accumulate. And I would have to come up with these large, huge installations because that's how much trash I would have in my you know, spare bedroom. And also it is the easiest way to confront a person is to hit them with something larger than life, which is exactly what I did. Uh, I went big. So I started getting support from different places. This was an installation I had built where I made a roof 
out of all of the water packaging waste that um, the bottles come in. I would go and collect it from the different markets and cafes after they were done, they would throw it away. And I sewn them all together and built a roof that goes on top of a place called Wild Jordan, which is a sustainable restaurant here as well. And that was uh, the patio roofing for the outdoor area, which was really beautiful and uh, really amazing. And that got a lot of press because it's a place that a lot of people visit. And it was the first time that these like recycled installations uh, were starting to pop up more and more often. You know, I was doing the work and putting it up wherever I could find. And um, I started getting a lot of questions about it and started doing workshops with children, going around to schools, doing seminars and talking about waste consumption. And one of the huge issues here is that even if you want to recycle, it requires a lot of work. You have to collect it in your home. You have to sort through it. And then you have to physically drive it somewhere to drop it off. And usually with this type of work, um, recycling and reusing and uh, the educational component is seen through the higher class, the lower class in Jordan, along with most of the Middle East or anywhere is not having the same exposure. They are not having the same curriculum as private schools are. They are not having same access to waste as higher end individuals are. So this also became a problem telling children we need to reuse this material or not throw it directly in the trash or find an alternative when the income is very low for the family or they just don't have trash. They don't have a dumpster for 50 or you know 40 feet from the area you're in. So that was that was an interesting part of the work to try and find a solution while I'm telling people we need to do something else with this. So with that I started doing the drawings and uh, I created a series of drawings on plastic bags. So whenever I would see a plastic bag, I would collect it and make a collage of the bags layered on top of each other. And then I would do a drawing. And this was uh, my feminism and environmental series where the women kept popping up in my life. The women I kept thinking about were my mothers and my aunts and these Assyrian warriors with the the jewels around the head and the large earrings. And, you know, when we're dancing, we have the fabrics with the sequins that are very beautiful and hand sewn and this delicacy and fragility that go into our women, but also this strength that is very present and dominant in the family. So I created a series of women that represented you know, our Assyrian culture by these small little details of the beads going across in the forehead and uh, the shapes of the earrings and the looms and the layers that come down and dangle and feel like poetry when you see them dated back in our traditional clothing and heritage. And I just wanted to portray that in a modern way. So I continued with the plastic waste and started doing these women. And through the series, different things started popping up with the colors and the traditions of texture and how bright our women are with our, you know, dresses and just bedazzlement of beauty that emits everywhere. And um, yeah, so this piece reminded me of my grandmother because she would always have these these beautiful fabrics from Iraq where she had brought into America and the earrings that are within my mother's jewelry box that she finds are a little too flashy to wear in Western culture, but she never wants to give away. And as a child, you're always going through the jewelry box. And yes. <laughs> same, same thing I did. That. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so a, a lot of the feminist drawings go back to the Assyrian heritage and mother and warrior and female goddess and strength, but also this 
these eyes that speak to your soul within the beauty. And I mean, you see photos of your family when they were in Iraq and the women and their eyeliners and mascara. And I mean, I've, our, our women are gorgeous. Our women are beautiful women. And uh, to, to try and draw that is nearly impossible. So <laughs> my attempts are made. And um, yeah, so these are plastic bag drawings. And as you can see, even on the right-hand side, there's, they're written on the, the fruit plastic bags, like suffocation, if hazard and choked and swallowed. And what I do is I do these drawings and I double glass frame them. So the texture is still eminent, but also it is a flat drawing on both sides. And on the back, you can actually see um, like the, the waist of the logos of these Jordanian companies that are here. So it, it creates a type of responsibility as well to go back to where it stems, which I always found so interesting. And Maria, I have a question. So um, the what are the materials that you're using to to draw on these plastic bags? Is it is it like an oil base? Is it um, like a specific type of paint that you use, acrylic or anything? Well, in the beginning of these drawings, it started during the corona pandemic when we were all isolated and missing home and family. So I was doing the women drawings, thinking of my mother and um, Assyrians. But unfortunately, I could only get my hands on grocery store markers because they were the only people that were delivering. Jordan was in full lockdown, so we couldn't leave our home and we were getting everything delivered. So I was just playing a guessing game with the materials, just ordering whatever kind of markers and pens I could find. Um, so a lot of these are just you know, permanent markers. And then on top of that, I will use paint markers, which are water-based, not oil-based. But after everything started opening back up, I was able to get different sizes and different brands. And um, yeah, so you can kind of see that the paint markers are the really bright color ones in the photos, the yellows, the greens, the pinks. And then you can see what looks like watercolors as the tones of the images of the face, the blue and the green lips. These are the permanent markers. And um, after a while, you start to create a technique to get this like mysterious type of tonage value that changes. But yeah, they're just your regular paint markers and permanent markers. So here's some more images of the shapes and the jewelry and the type of women that speak to us or speak to me from dating back. And then I was able to go back into the large scale installations because the galleries started opening up again. And with that, I started creating these um, things that reminded me of our holidays because I'm in Jordan. And I am not able to celebrate Christmas here. I always have to go home when I want to visit my family. So I wanted to create a Christmas tree out of plastic waste. So the Karner Art Space, uh, they were able to offer me the gallery to create a Christmas tree, which I thought was very beautiful because it was the first time I was able to make one out of plastic. And they had lights put in, and you can see the Ergila pipes, they're white, and they look like garland, which is what we have in our homes. Um, and I used bottle caps and created it with all the plastic waste I collected from the cafes, and even the plastic packaging in the bottom, even the boxes are gift wrapped in local plastic bags. So they're all like Rowan Cafe and these Jordanian places. Uh, that are here. So that was a very interesting, fun project that was able to go back to large scale after working with the women in these small intimate settings with a pen and paper and plastic. And this is called the Ocean Room, a uh, plastic waste. Here in Jordan, the parliament politicians, when they go to run for office, 
They have these huge canvases where they imprint their face and their uh, advertisement for what they're running for and what they stand for. And it's just put up all over uh, in Jordan and in Amman. And there was an initiative here called Recycle Art Festival where they collected these banners, over 60,000 of these banners that were gonna get thrown away after the parliament election. And I created a room that represented Aqaba which is the sea here. And it's about when we use these plastic materials, it goes back into our natural reserves. It goes back into our local areas and it gets back into our ecosystem, which eventually comes back to us. And I really wanted it to be a direct way for people to understand what is happening now. And that if we don't make the change we want to be, then it's gonna be too late. And uh, also to remind people that it's not happening somewhere else far away. It's, it's right here. It's right here in our wadis. It's right here in Aqaba. It's right here in our landfills. Like everything is collected here in Jordan. It's not these major corporations. So with this piece, I really wanted it to speak to the masses. And um, yeah, this is just accumulation of different things I've done here over the past two and a half years different plastic projects, collecting plastic with eco-hikers, uh, large-scale installation I made that's on uh, an NGO building here in Jebel Natif out of at Gila Pipes plastic bottles. And yeah, if there's any contact information, you can follow my social media accounts. I'm very active. It's where most of almost everything I'm doing is posted. It's all up to date. And then also my WhatsApp number. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for your beautiful presentation and for sharing your art with us. I mean, it's so intricate and unique and beautiful that um, I'm glad that you were able to present to us. Um, so now we'll move forward with our Q&A portion of this webinar. So as a reminder, you could use um, the Q&A button or the chat button um, to go ahead and post your question. So um, I know I have some and uh, a few people have some as well. So uh, let me go back, Let's see. Um, so let's go back to your, your time spent in Italy. Given that you had all these huge art installations, um, did you find that most Italians were positively curious about our Assyrian identity or, um, or maybe they already knew about the Assyrians? Um, kind of give us a little bit of a idea of how the Italians felt when looking at your art. Well, the Italians in the beginning, um... No, they don't. I, the scholars know about the Assyrian heritage, um, the highly educated, educated. My professors knew about the heritage, um, the people that were my mentors. Um, but as far as the younger generation, no, not at all. And when they heard that I was Iraqi background, Assyrian, most people thought it was uh, Muslim based or Arabic and uh, didn't under, didn't even know that there were, you know, Christian Middle Eastern people, let alone our minority that started civilization, but they were very open-minded. Italians are amazing and um, super refreshing and curious, wanted to know so much questions and incredibly supportive. I mean, a very supportive art community that was seen there. And yes. I bet they made that connection with coffee. They're like, we drink coffee. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the coffee performance was uh like my big bang before I left and uh it definitely was a huge success everyone was super excited the Italians were talking about it afterwards my friends had messaged me about it it was it was That's very cool, cool. very cool <laughs> to show you know um, people yeah, and um, now we're going to transition. We're going to go all over the place, but it's okay. Um, so now we're transitioning to your time spent in Greece with your art therapy um, business. So how did this art therapy uh, part of your life help you understand your Assyrian identity? Well, it helped me understand mostly the way that how difficult it was for the Assyrians coming to America from this very strong, enriching 
uh, culture being ripped apart from them and then having to refamiliarize themselves with a new environment and new surroundings. Because I saw that with the refugees that were coming from these different countries. And even though the backgrounds were different, the scenario was the same. They were fleeing their country because they wanted to have a better life, a better future and not suffer. And it was really, it really helped me understand my mother and my father. It helped me understand how they shut down the communication when it came to discussing what had happened in the past. And it opened my eyes a little bit more about why they was so much anger. There's so much anger when they they speak about it. There's so much anger when they are hearing you speak about it. I mean, there, there's just this huge amount of unresolved conflict. And when the refugees arrive and we're doing the art therapy, there's a lot of that that resonates and is brought up. And you see it, you recognize that this is the same thing that they're experiencing, except it's 20 years later. So that experience was very important because I knew that I could recognize it because this is familiar. I know this. I mean, I didn't experience it myself, but I know this through my family and I need them to get it out. I needed, I needed to work through that with the refugees because I couldn't, I wasn't around to work through it with my family. And on that sense, do you think that art therapy could be this medium that's needed for our Syrian community when they migrate from, uh, you know, Iraq, Syria, other areas in the Middle East into America? Do you think that could be a, a medium that could be very beneficial for, for people who are coming here uh, to the U.S.? <laughs> Absolutely. I believe in art therapy. I've seen what it does to people. I have seeing the release of tension and the way they're able to express themselves freely without feeling judged or having to communicate every small detail. Art therapy gives them the opportunity to release what they're holding inside and continue to work on their communication and emotional skills. It gives them the medium to channel their energy out into the world without any of the negative consequences. It's a positive experience. Even during the trauma, bringing it all up is a release from their bodies. Yeah. Um, so when creating the feminist art pieces, uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, how did it make you feel looking back at them now as you were presenting? And then also another question, um, did your family know that you took inspiration from them when creating these pieces? Um, no, my family did not know. <laughs> uh, I, I, I talked to my family about it. Um, and my mom is very interested. My mom is very supportive now when it comes to raising awareness through the women in our family and what's happening uh, with feminism right now and all of these these touchy subjects that are you know breaking walls down but uh, my family did not know no I'm pretty sure that we're gonna have some conversations after they see this video <laughs> um, I mean they follow my social media account and they know the the coherent themes but I don't think they know in detail and as far as seeing it now, later, pride is a, a way I would describe that feeling. I am proud of our women. I am proud of what runs through our veins. There is a type of genetic ancestral heritage that you can feel inside of you. And I was working through that during those drawings, channeling in that feeling and creating something and birthed it to life to feel it in a modernized way that is empowering. I feel empowered when I see my work about the feminist series. 
and um, talking about your art pieces. Um, where are they now? I know we, we spoke prior and you were mentioning how they're at different galleries and, and different people purchasing from around the world. Can you kind of uh, tell the audience about the, your success? And also, can you elaborate a little bit more about how one individual can buy an art piece? Um, I know you mentioned social media, but I don't know if there's another avenue, but please let us know. Yeah, sure. So I currently have work in America. Um, I ship it to clients there that are interested. And whenever people see a piece, if they're interested, they just send me a message and I respond. Um, I mean, it is something I am hoping to create a source of income because <laughs> there is a lot accountable that is not uh, seen in the work, uh, the actual collection and hand washing the trash and drying and then bringing it and cutting it like before the pen touches the paper. I mean, before pen touches plastic. Uh, so yeah, my pieces are all for sale always. And I am very responsive when it comes to messages. My pieces are in America right now. I have an installation in Italy. I have work all over Jordan. I am shipping a piece to go to Dubai soon. And they're, I mean, they're mostly galleries in Jordan right now. Um, when I'm doing work, it's just very quickly. But yeah, I mean, they're all for sale. They're all seen um, throughout my page. I also do custom orders. I've had people ask me for specific things they want or uh, certain animals that they're interested in to do the drawings of or to come and do workshops. So I'm, I mean, it, it's just me. And most of the time, my boyfriend, who is a very good supporter as well. So it's not this like huge organization. Hi, I'll respond to you. Here's my phone number. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we have a few questions in the audience. I just want to make sure we, we have enough time to kind of um, to talk about. So um, where would you create these large installations? Um, and was the materials hard to get during COVID? I, I, you kind of collab, you kind of spoke about the last, um, last one earlier, but um, yeah, this person's interested in where you create these large installations. You know what? I'm just gonna show you guys. This is a little behind the scenes action and it's so unclean and unfiltered. So it's completely raw. This <laughs> is my studio. Oh, wow. This is where I get all of the stuff. I put them in bags. They're all labeled. It looks really messy, but I know where things are. So yeah, the drawings, the plastic bags, everything just goes in my second bedroom. And yeah, whenever I need them, I just grab them from here. And whenever I'm to walking my dog, or I'm collecting from people that know I collect, like the cafes and restaurants, I add it to the segregated pile of what I need and I just take it. Because unfortunately, plastic is not something difficult to find here. Mm -hmm. And it is very easily collected. And yeah, um, I'm hoping, hoping that uh, it will not be the case in a few years. But as of right now, it's all too easy to get. And during COVID, it was actually easier because everyone was getting things wrapped in packaging because we consider it hygienic and sterilized. So yeah, there was yeah. actually a larger amount with the rubber gloves and the masks and all of our plastic containers of hygiene unfortunately increased our plastic waste consumption when it came to single use plastics. So it's rather easy. And I walk my dog twice a day. So that's two times a day, the opportunity to collect what I see on the streets. And on the weekends, we go for hikes in wadis where a lot of the locals will throw the trash away in the water streams and in the land. Okay. And, um, Another person goes, uh, well, the first is going to compliment you. I love the translu uh, translucency of the pieces. Can you talk a little about how you use light with these pieces? Some seem positioned so beautifully in the windows with the viewer able to see through the piece to the space or landscape beyond. Okay, so um, as you can see in some of these pieces, I'm assuming that we're speaking of the drawings, not the installations. 
Um, I think they're talking, yeah, I think they're talking about the drawings. I think so. Okay, yeah. So with the drawings, as you can see in some of these, um, my boyfriend is great at photography. This is not me. Uh, I like to take credit for a lot of things, but he does this whole scene and set up to where he can get the light really great with the photos. But I mean, in person, they're so much better. You don't need great lighting. For some reason, they don't photograph well because of the glass. So I have actually taken these and placed them against the window, which is incredibly beautiful because you see the different layers of plastic where you kind of lose it here. And that is not photographed in these pictures. So yeah, it depends. We usually light it with lights on top in galleries. So the galleries will have the headlights that are on the ceiling and we just position it to kind of go on. Here we go. Um, you can kind of see it in this photo of me standing next to three pieces that are framed on the wall. This was at Landmark Hotel. And she had the lights emitting from below and one from above. And that, that usually is enough to resonate with it because the pieces are very bright and colorful. It's, it's not like they're dark images. So the, the colors pop out on their own. I don't know if that answered the question. I hope so. I think so. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll do one more question before we um, we close, unless anybody has any other ones. Um, so this is a personal question. So as a political scientist scholar myself, um, I find the canvassing piece, the art piece that she spoke about, and he also created, um, really interesting. And um, this question is kind of uh, on the far end, but um, do you think plastic waste in Amman will ever uh, change that would be beneficial to the people and so that plastic wouldn't be so much ingrained in their culture? I love that question. Yes, I do think it will change. I think it's going to change with the younger generations. I think that culture and tradition is very much embedded in the older generations. And I mean, even in our Assyrian culture, you know, it's, it's hard to change things over time. But I think with the younger generation, the children, they will take plastic waste and use it in a different way. I mean, I am talking to them when I go and do these workshops and these seminars with the kids. And they are already coming up with these great ideas that, you know, pencil holders for bottles or taking a bag and reusing it to put your school supplies in and these great things that obviously they are coming up with because they're interested and in not throwing things away. And when I do these workshops with the kids, I tell them about the educational component that goes with the plastic waste. Then they go home and I see them again the next day because they're consensual workshops and they come back with questions, wanting to know what they can do to change, wanting to know the alternatives, wanting to know how it affects them. I mean, children are like sponges, they absorb. And I think that in Jordan, I have seen a shift in waste consumption here and um, educational parts of people going out and speaking to the younger generations about what's going on with our waste. And I think that when they become political leaders or they get into parliament and they are at the generation to make the change, they will implement it. And I think that's gonna be global, not just uh, Middle Eastern or you know, right here in Jordan, I think that it's the younger generations that are gonna take the plastic waste and find new ways to reuse it that's beneficial and to end it and make large corporations held responsible. Well, thank you, Maria, for answering uh, my questions and the audience's questions as well. Um, so we have officially reached the end of this webinar and I wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone who joined us today. In addition, I also wanna especially thank our presenter, Maria, um, your artwork is an inspiration, and please continue to create these pieces that can be enjoyed around the world, and also who are very, you know, educational pieces that we can learn from and and um, and see our own identity in as well. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. 
for all your studies and research and um, wanting to shine light on what's going on with our culture and our heritage. And thank you all for the viewers as well for every question and participant. Perfect. Um, so for our attendees, uh, just want to make sure to encourage you to subscribe to our email list. Uh, visit our website and follow us at Assyrian Studies on all social media platforms to stay informed about upcoming webinars that we're going to be having really soon, um, as well as events, uh, future grant opportunities that will be arising by the end of this year, so stay tuned for that. And um, as always, thank you for supporting us, and we hope to see you soon.